Imagine then being charged for manslaughter for a drug error. Julie had been a nurse with 15 years of outstanding service. After an intense double shift of almost 17 hours, followed by only six hours rest, she connected the wrong infusion to a patient. The patient subsequently died. Julie was charged with manslaughter and dismissed from her job. She subsequently had a breakdown. It raises uh, very, very important questions about how you respond to harm that occurs within the health sector. Um, Julie is with us here today, Julie Tao, um, and her mentor, Frank Giletto, who is a chief, technology, chief technologist from Texas Medical Institute of Technology and from the Institute of Health Improvement in Boston. Thank you, Don. I'm going to try to keep my comments short so we can um, get as much time we can with Julie. But my role today is really to introduce Julie's powerful story and provide an overview of the contributing factors that led to a fatal error and Julie being charged with manslaughter. As John said, Julie had been practicing in the labor and delivery for over 19 years. She was well liked and respected by her peers and had a great reputation as a team player. She'd be the nurse's nurse, the person that you could always turn to. She had started in her unit a bereavement program to help support mothers who lost their newborns. For over 19 years, Julie did not make a medication error. But on a busy holiday, the 4th of July, 2006, she commits an error that takes the life of a 16-year-old expecting mother. As a result of several system failures, Julie mistakenly takes an epidural solution instead of an antibiotic solution and connects it to an IV line. The patient goes into an immediate card cardiac arrest. A code is called as is an emergency C-section to save the baby. Despite tending to the patient for over two hours, the code team is not able to revive the mother. What happens after this tragic event and what Julie will share with you truly illustrates our healthcare current gap in caring for our own ca caregivers when system failures and fatigue result in human error. In Julie's case, there were several contributing factors. The first one was fatigue. Actually, there was a policy at the hospital that would recognize and reward nurses that took on extra shifts. So on this 4th of July, a very busy weekend, everybody wants to have off, there was a uh, call for, for help from the unit. And as Julie had done many a times before, she decided to take on the extra shifts. She worked for 16 and a half hours, slept for less than five hours in an empty patient room, and began her third shift at 7 a.m. the next day. The second contributing factor was a formalized workaround that had been developed and put in place by the unit's practice council as part of a physician satisfaction program. Patients would be prepared for an epidural before the anesthesiologist arrived. The goal of the to-do list was to decrease the amount of time anesthesia had to spend in the unit. The list guided nurses to obtain the epidural medication, insert and prime the tubing, place the meds in the infusion pumps ahead of time, and have the paperwork ready for the physician to sign when they arrive. Just like every nurse on the unit, Julie prepared everything and had everything ready to go. The next contributing factor was a recent technology deployment. There was a new barcode system that was being adopted for all the medications in the unit. The technology had been in place only two weeks prior to the event, and Julie had been out for one of those weeks. So her training, for lack of a better term, had been rushed. Also, as with every technology, there were some teething problems. The new scanner was unreliable in scanning clear infusion bags, and the medication had to be, and medication information would then have to be entered manually. The day prior to the event, Julie had had repeated problems with the system and had all but given up on scanning IV bags. The final contributing factor was similarity of the IV bags. The packaging for the epidural and the antibiotic solution were very similar with uh, both clear infusion bags and identical ports, making them both compatible for IV tubing. And even though they were appropriately labeled, they were easily confused. 
when Julie went to dispense the antibiotic solution, she did not try to use the barcode because she had had so many problems beforehand. She inadvertently picked up the epidural bag and delivered the epidural solution, uh, medication through the intravenous route that was meant for the antibiotic, causing the patient to arrest. After the code, when the error was discovered and Julie realized what had happened, she collapsed and was admitted to the hospital. They put her under suicide watch. The weeks that followed, she was terminated from her post with no severance pay. Certain facts about the event were leaked to the press. She was subsequently criminally charged by the state attorney general for manslaughter because she had uh, administered drug without a physician order but also been negligent about it. When she returned to the hospital where she had practiced for over 19 years for pastoral care, the administration asked her to leave the premises and not to return. In the darkest hours that followed, she was entirely abandoned, facing the possibility of jail time, a large fine, loss of license, and loss of livelihood. Ultimately, due to the cost of going to trial, she plea bargained and accepted a conviction of two misdemeanor, thereby avoiding jail time. The Board of Nursing also concluded their investigation and opted not to revoke her license and to allow her within a year to practice again. Her life, however, has never been the same, and she's yet to return to nursing. Well, this story clearly started with a tragedy. It's been an inspiration and the basis for a nationally recognized safe practice addressing the care of the caregiver involved in adverse events. In the last two and a half years, she's been work working with us at TMIT, and Julie has been embraced by the leaders of patient safety who are using her case to avoid and prevent future harm to both patients and caregiver. She'll now share her journey of those last two and a half years. very best. Three and a half years ago, after spending nearly 20 years as a dedicated OB nurse and unit coordinator for perinatal loss and bereavement, doing the work I loved, I made a human error. And it took the life of my beloved patient and it left me forever changed. I believed I was, one, uh, I was entirely at fault and 100% responsible. How could my eyes be looking at one thing and my brain not recognize that I wasn't holding what I thought I was? Over the last three years since this tragedy occurred, I have heard from numerous people, mostly nurses, who tell me I am so glad you are out there reminding healthcare workers how important it is to be careful so things like this stop happening. Although some harmful events are the result of intentional carelessness and negligence, the vast majority are not. It would be so much simpler if this were really what it was all about. I could come here today and remind you all that we have the ability to be infallible if we just follow every rule, protocol, policy, and always be very, very careful. You could go back to your organization remembering this and all errors would stop. I am not here to encourage you to stop doing these things. All that I have just mentioned is extremely important. But unfortunately, it is not enough. There will never be a point where you have achieved enough skill, experience, knowledge, vigilance, prudence, awareness, and carefulness 
to be able to fully control whether you will commit an error or not, or to overcome the limitations of the human condition. There is not one single common thread or characteristic about a person that makes him or her more or less likely to commit an unintentional error. What does seem to be similar, though, among errors is the environment, the conditions surrounding, the systems, the processes, and the equipment involved that in some way reinforces and nurtures the likelihood of the error occurring. Since becoming a certified patient safety officer at the Institute of Healthcare Improvements Intense Course at Boston, I found out that this error was somewhat predictable given the contributing and supporting factors. I now know that the same set of contributing factors and systems that helped nurture the likelihood that this error would eventually happen could have unfolded in any caregiver. It did not require me. This type of error does not require incompetence, inexperience, a lack of compliance, compassion, or dedication. This error did not happen because of who I am or who I was. It happened in spite of who I was. I didn't know these things three and a half years ago when this happened. In fact, I was guilty of believing that errors required incompetence, inexperience, and carelessness, and therefore would never be something that I would experience. It's unacceptable to me. I'm so grateful to know these truths that I've learned. Does this mean that I no longer feel responsible for what happened? Does this mean that I don't blame myself? No, this will be my daily struggle for the rest of my life. I would do anything to undo what happened. I raged and battled for more than a year to finally accept the fact that the loss of my life would not bring her back. Every single morning for the rest of my life, when I open up my eyes, I have to come to grips again with the fact that this is still real. The moment I realized what had happened, I fell to the floor. I was flooded with the most intense revulsion for this body and mind that had betrayed me. My world stopped. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't crawl. I couldn't think for all these years as a bereavement counselor when someone had lost a child it was my arms that had done the embracing and it held these mothers to my heart to now be the person who had brought the grief to the mother was much more than I could bear I could hear my soul pounding on the inside of my chest to get out, insisting that it could not stay and be this person who had done this. For many months, I begged and pleaded with death to take me. When a tragic event like this happens, it is truly a medical emergency, not only for the patient involved, but for the caregiver involved as well. I am asking all of you to go back to your organizations and ensure that there is some sort of action plan in place to immediately recognize that caregiver when there is an adverse event. The minute an adverse event occurs, that caregiver is no longer a caregiver. He or she is your patient. There needs to be clear steps as to what happens next. Ideally, 
you will have enough staff interested and committed to the supportive care of their coworkers, that response teams can be trained and prepared to respond when needed. Ideally, team members should be specially trained in crisis intervention, emotional needs assessment, and supportive care in the stages of grief. The ideal can't be met, of course, there's always you, and you can be there if possible. Some caregivers may need very little support. Others may have a delayed reaction of despair, guilt, fear, or shame, and may need time off work, counseling services, or, uh, or, or coworkers who are willing to stay with them as time passes. Others may have an immediate and profound reaction of despair, including thoughts of suicide and a need for immediate intervention. The understanding of the stages and process of grief, understanding that the immediate response of both the family and the caregiver involved may be that of shock and disbelief. It is important to know this because it is difficult to display the full scope of emotions felt at that time, uh, to know or express your needs or to even hear what is being said. Understanding this will give a team member uh, the, uh, the knowledge they need to provide continuing, sequential, ongoing assessment, communication, and support. At the very least, it's important to remove that caregiver from the situation. The shock of the moment may um, place that caregiver in a, a state of um, not being able to emotionally react at that point. That caregiver may feel a profound need to assist in the, um, in, in the response or in the code, um, it's, it's, it's important not to. When the team arrived for the code, um, the first questions were, who's in charge here? And immediately it was fingers over my head saying, she's in charge, she's her nurse. And um, that's, that's too difficult. Remove the, the, the caregiver from the situation. Assume that it's the right thing to do, even if the person wants to stay. Gently take them and, and uh, bring them where they can sit quietly with you. Begin to assess where they're at. Um, a lack of emotional uh, response at that point does not mean that there's not going to be. Your assessment needs to be ongoing with that person. It's okay to assess a need for time off work even if the shock is preventing them from feeling that that is important. It's okay to assess that that is what's needed and to make that happen. Contrary to belief, your memory is not good at that point. Um, uh, it was believed at that time where, where I was working that um, quickly and as soon as possible, let's make this report while this is fresh in your mind. Um, I would be able to write a much more helpful and accurate report today than I did then. And it's okay to assess a need to stay with that care work, uh, caregiver and even uh, accompany them to their home. Following an event such as this, if somehow the focus changed from who's at fault, who should we blame to that of the patient and family and what they deserve, we would hear that overwhelmingly what they want is for us, our entire organization, to learn from these errors and to work together with them to ensure that this never happens to another patient. It becomes very difficult to make this happen for patients and their families in an organization focused on individual blame and harsh punitive measures. All too often, ill advice from financially focused attorneys and risk managers limits the transparency and disclosure process. The caregivers removed from the equation, prevented from any opportunity to fall at the feet of the patient or the family in apology. We know that the lack of this contact and apology leaves the family feeling angry, empty, and re-injured, significantly impeding their grieving and healing process. Interestingly, it is the lack 
of this same opportunity for contact and apology that haunts the caregiver and leaves an open, unhealing wound. I believe that what ends up happening when a caregiver is treated unjustly following an adverse event is that another victim of this error is created. That victim is the hospital and the staff that are left behind. Staff are left behind to see what has happened to one of their own. Trust and morale decreases. People start just kind of showing up for work instead of engaging anymore. What they have seen has reinforced their resistance and unwillingness to report errors that we all know can easily go unnoticed. The ability to apply the valuable information that can be learned from these error and near miss reports is lost. Errors continue to happen and perhaps even increase. Future patients of this organization begin to receive what they don't deserve. And we fail to give the original harm patient and family what they deserved and desired. And so you can see that care of the caregiver becomes much more than just taking care of an individual. Our hope is that healthcare leaders will recognize the critical responsibility to own and be accountable for the systems, the environment, and the culture that your frontline caregivers practice in. When this spirit of ownership and accountability does not exist among the leadership of an organization, then following a catastrophic event, the unprepared knee-jerk reaction is one of fear. Fear of litigation, fear of financial loss, fear of loss of reputation. This fear and unwillingness to take an accountable, systems-focused approach forces the focus to the caregiver involved in the unintentional error. It becomes necessary to blame them solely for what happened. If the individual is solely at fault and completely responsible, then punitive measures begin to make sense. On the other hand, in those organizations where patient-centered care, patient safety, and doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do are not just agenda items and committee titles, but passions that live and thrive in the very hearts of the leaders. A very different, predictable set of behaviors unfold. Behaviors that courageously pick up the pieces following a devastating event and stand together with the broken family, patient, and caregiver, resisting the advice to limit transparency and disclosure, and together begin the process of doing whatever it takes to prevent this from ever happening again in the future. If you are a caregiver, my wish for you is that you could someday hear your leaders say the following words to you. If you are a leader, I challenge you to find the courage to go back to your caregivers with these words. Listen, we see that you are here because your heart is so into this, that you intend to do your very best, that this is your heart and soul and life's calling. This is your passion. We're going to support you with the best systems in place. We're going to take a look at every one of them. We are going to make it very difficult to do the wrong thing and easier and easier to do the right thing. We are committed to understanding how human factors predictably affect human performance. And we are going to put safety nets in place to prevent harm from occurring when and if human limitations prevail and an error occurs. We're going to fix the systems that are broken. We want you to help us with that. And when and if we fail, we fail together. When we fall, we're going to fall together. And when we stand, we're going to stand together. And we're going to learn from each other. 
I came here today because I can guarantee that in every organization you represent, there are or someday will be hurting people who have been involved in an unintentional adverse event. I ache to reach them. I can't, but you can. Please take my hands with you. Take my heart with you. And together, let's seek them out. Reach out to them and let them know that you are open and interested in knowing how they are doing and feeling. Support them in whatever way you can. Suggest ways that you can help this person. As in, can we get together again after work and talk more together? Don't just say, if there's anything I can do, just let me know. This person has no idea what he or she needs. Share with them what you have learned here. Let them know that this did not happen because of who they are, but in spite of who they are. Let them know that to you, this person is still all he or she was before this occurred, that you'll always remember them for that and not for this event, and that this event does not define who they are. Before you go, um, I, I think it would just be helpful because of your particular responsibilities, both of you, um, because obviously some incredible problems are thrown up by what Julie has told us. Um, Martin, your job is to devise a method of understanding the risks to patients in a medical system. Um, clearly, the criminalisation of of what appears at any rate to be an honest and um, desperate mistake uh, is presumably going to lead to a lack of openness, fear, blame culture. How do you, how do you find the balance? We, we live, I mean, for anybody who isn't British, we live in a system in which we had the terrible, terrible incident of Harold Shipman, who was a GP who killed many hundreds of his patients. Uh, and clearly, w w there is, must be a huge temptation when something like that happens to devise uh, methods and, and, and responses that respond to that. How do you respond to this? Well, let, let me make three comments. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. I think the power of the story is just makes everything so real, I think. So thank you very much. I just think what you've said is such a timely reminder of the challenge of building an open and fair culture in healthcare, and I don't think we can be complacent for a moment about um, the challenge of that and, 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 and what lies ahead of us in terms of that still being um, a major area of focus for us in our work on patient safety. And then I think the other thing that you've highlighted very, very powerfully is, is, is really the, the, the whole concept of the second victim, really, that we, we, we know that, of course, uh, patients and their families who experience an adverse event are, are obviously, um, you know, harmed and affected by that event. But let, let us not forget, as you have powerfully illustrated, um, the second victim in this, which is, which is the healthcare worker. So I think, I think what you said is a very timely reminder about, about this being an incredibly important focus for our effort moving forward. And when it comes to being at the sharp end of responsibility in a large hospital in which you've got the lives of children in your hands, um, how do you establish a culture that is honest and open um, when a tragedy like this occurs? Um, I think 
think it really depends on what your culture has been before that. And us, like I'm sure everyone else here, we're always moving to do better because good will never be good enough. But if you have the ingredients of a just culture, transparency, respect, uh, and in particular, a kind of peer support network, I think um, you're, you're on the road to, to being able to do things right. I think the point that you brought up is we wait till somebody comes to us for help, and I think the more important thing that we need to learn to do is to proactively go to the individual who has been involved with a particular uh, incident, and I, I will take that home with me because that, that is something that well, I'd like to thank on behalf of the, everybody here, Julie, and, and all four of you very much for, for giving us a, a really very, very helpful period. Thank you very much.